What's up, Poppy friends? I've gotten a lot of comments and questions in the past about how I develop my army color schemes and color palettes. And I wanted to take this opportunity to just formally record and document the, the theory or my approach to actually building these color palettes. And hopefully it'll help you develop your own color schemes for your own projects. So I have two basic rules that govern how I approach developing an army's color scheme. The first is that I need it to be simple and easily repeatable. And that means breaking down the color palette into a few main colors. And the second is three to four feet. As an army, most often you're seeing all the models from an arm's length on the tabletop. And that means you're seeing the models from three to four feet. And that keys into the first point where you need a few main colors to really make the models pop and draw all the attention. If you have too many colors going on, the models become too busy, they lack focus, and they don't really draw attention. And this is uh, doubly important when you start to go into uh, tournament play and perhaps even for, for competitions like Armies on Parade. When you're going for painting scores, you're looking at uh, judges who are walking by rows and rows and tables and tables of armies, you need to have a way to make your army pop. And one of the easiest ways is having a very simple, very sharp color palette with a few colors that jump up and grab your attention. So really my approach is to think of it in terms of primary, secondary, and tertiary. Now this is the way I do it. You can go primary and secondary and have only two main colors for the army, or you can even have primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, which is a word I just learned for this video, and have four main colors. But I tend to stick with the three. I feel that things in nature tend to work better in threes. Um, you get a nice sort of triangle of color when you actually use a color wheel and a color palette. And that's how I tend to approach building my color schemes. I can then supplement those three main colors with accent colors that don't quite dominate the color scheme, but can be used without overpowering the three main colors. So what do I mean by primary, secondary, and tertiary colors? Well, the way I think about it is that the primary color is the main dominant color that grabs your attention first, with the secondary color being the second dominant color that helps support the primary color. I'll also frequently introduce a third tertiary color that supports the first two, and sometimes interchanging the secondary and tertiary colors to both create some variety and changing up the way I can use a color palette without introducing new colors. So oftentimes uh, we find ourselves building a color palette from scratch. And this most often happens whenever we want to paint an army or a model in a certain color, or we have a certain color or colors that we want to use. And we're not really using any sort of existing reference or um, color scheme. And what we're doing is essentially starting from the ground up. And I highly recommend using um, a color wheel or a tool like Paladin uh, to do this. Uh, this is a free website and it allows you to build a color palette based on a lot of deep options. And you can really play around with all the different values to establish things like your highlight and shade tones for each of your colors. Um, you can pick your color scheme depending on a monochromatic, um, having a complementary color scheme, triadic, quadratic, um, or even some sort of um, adjacent color scheme. There's a lot of room to play around with and to, well, I want to call it maneuver within this website that gives you a very, very solid uh, starting point in terms of building your color palette. So for example, if we're going to be building a simple uh, two-tone color palette, Paladin gives us the option to pick a main color. Um, it'll automatically provide the opposite color. We can play around with the exact saturation of our different hues. And you can see that it provides us with our highlight and shade values. And this is also really useful once you've picked your colors and you've determined um, how saturated or desaturated you want the palette to be, to then start to color match your paints. Palatin is a really, really great tool that lets you very easily pick and choose your, your colors and develop that deep color palette. Alternatively, what I often like to do is to build a palette from reference images and, and mood boards. My inspiration often comes from viewing other models or other artwork, and that helps me to establish a, a look or a mood 
or even give me a, a jumping point to, to have a color or set of colors to work with. And very often what I'll do is I'll build a mood board or reference board in Pinterest and then start to take those colors and those values and plug them into Paladin to build a more robust color palette and SWAT set. So My Night Haunt was a really good example of this because before I even started collecting the army, I had in my mind a vision of some sort of Mayan or Incan, very tribal theme to the army, at least in the beginning. It didn't ultimately pan out just because my skill in terms of approaching a lot of the conversions I wanted to do and the sculpting just wasn't up to par. And then as I started to play games with the army, I hit a bit of a hiccup in the very, very beginning where the army just wasn't playing at the power level I expected it to. And I sort of lost interest in the project very early on. So I had a very good, strong color palette. I had the colors picked out, but my motivation to work on the army died. So I didn't end up doing a lot of the original themes. I had wanted to incorporate things like these ink and headdresses, a lot of these tribal patterns I didn't end up doing. But the way I approached building the color palette is something I continue to do for, for all of my projects or a lot of my projects. As I was developing this mood board, and gathering my references for a lot of the conversions and the freehand I wanted to do, I was also keeping in mind and considering colors I wanted to paint. A couple of the, the big pieces I really, really liked, um, this one right here has this nice blue and this sort of ready orange combination, which we see pop up very often as well. A little bit more saturated, the same blue and orange. Really saturated blue and orange. And then even a, an accent color with this sort of off, off white ivory yellow. And then here as well with some browns um, and the, uh, this cream color. So this gave me a very strong uh, starting point, some sort of blue, some sort of orange, and then maybe a third accent color and a sort of um, ivory cream desaturated orange color. So I brought this into Palatin and I started playing around and I arrived at this. You can see that I have this um, sort of aqua blue, a little bit on the desaturated side as my primary or dominant color. My secondary is a sort of an terracotta earthy red brown color and a tertiary color, which was something like a caramel cappuccino is the closest I can describe it along with some swatches for how I want to bring up the highlights and the shadows. So this was my first pass. And what I ended up doing when I brought it over to start picking up the paints and develop a color concept or proof of concept in terms of actually painting a model, I ended up swapping my primary and secondary. So instead of the blue being the primary, it became my secondary and this sort of terracotta red became my primary color. However, as I mentioned earlier, and something you can always keep in mind is that once you have a color palette, you're not locked into keeping them as your primary, secondary, tertiary. You can use these colors interchangeably within an army. And because you're using those colors consistently throughout your entire force, whether they're your primary, secondary, or tertiary, regardless of how you mix it up, that consistency helps to tie everything in your collection together as one cohesive force. I also ended up punching the saturation on my highlights and shadows. And I ended up pushing it more towards something that looked a little like this with a bit more yellow. Uh, one of the limitations of, at least I found with this website is, it can sometimes be hard to tweak the individual values depending on the paint colors you're using. And you can hold shift and you can push individual uh, shade and highlight values, but you can't change or introduce a mix. So your blue tends to stay within the blue and this red tends to um, stay within that red. Um, what I often do when I develop and mix my colors, I mix in warm tones like yellows and um, ivories into my highlights to simulate the sun. And I mix in blues and greens and purples into my shadows as the opposite shade color which ends up creating a, a warmth and coolness that sometimes isn't always reflected in the swatches. But I think as a starting point, Palatin is still a very useful tool that I highly recommend you use, and it is free. 
Uh, you are also able to export these swatches as hex codes and you can uh, print them as some sort of uh, HTML page or whatever. So what does this look like in practice? Well, let me go through some of my own personal projects and armies and talk through this idea of having primary, secondary, tertiary tones, as well as talk a little bit more about accent colors, which I haven't really covered yet. And then, especially within my Nighthawk, show you how it's very easy to interchange these colors to create different combinations and have that variety in your army while still maintaining a cohesive looking collection. So for my Nighthawk, for the primary color, it's again this brown, red sort of terracotta fleshy tone. Um, and it does end up being a fleshy tone because of the highlight colors I end up using. Um, there are some flesh tones and some yellows in there that make it feel um, unintentionally like they're wearing uh, cut or draped flesh. And it does add that sort of grisly death nature to it. Um, but because it's not, or the flesh tone isn't a, a large part, it's still mainly uh, this earthy terracotta red. Um, it still feels colorful without being too grisly. The secondary color is this um, desaturated blue aqua tone, which ends up being pushed closer to ivory because of the Iraqi sand color I used as the highlight tone. And then the fleshy parts, so the faces, the skulls, the arms, the hands, becomes an extension of this blue color, this blue cloth, because it's the exact same colors. I just push the highlights more into an ivory and an off-white. My tertiary becomes, um, or my tertiary color was this cappuccino brown color that didn't end up being hyper dominant depending on uh, where you're looking at at the model. I focus this mainly on the base in terms of how I was dry brushing the stone and the ground. But a lot of that also mingles in with the chili flakes, which I use as a detailing accent color, which actually sort of becomes my new tertiary color but the yellows and reds and oranges of the flakes uh, do tie into both that initial tertiary cappuccino color as well as the terracotta color of the um, the cloth just a little more saturated so inadvertently it was an extension again of those colors from the color palette just a little more saturated and so it still ties in as part of that um, cohesive color palette for my accent colors, I'm essentially using my golds, my silvers, um, any browns for wooden elements. I have black leather straps, so it, it becomes this sort of um, black to a dark red, almost a blue tone because of the colors I used. And when I say accent colors, these are basically little details and things that are scattered throughout a model and you can paint them in whatever color you want, but they're not a dominant part of the model and so they're not gonna draw too much attention or be too distracting in having those colors uh, that don't exist as part of your main color palette, but are still on the model. Now, something you do have to be careful is having too many accent colors. One of the problems I ran into when I was painting my Death Watch Chaplain, for example, was having too many accents. And it ended up creating a very distracting look for the model overall, and it doesn't feel as cohesive as it could be especially considering the three to four foot rule. No real one color on this Death Watch model stands out. And so I think it doesn't draw as much attention on the tabletop. Briefly bringing it back to the idea of being able to swap or interchange the colors as well. Um, if you look at, for example, this Dreadblade Harrow, the main color becomes, or the blue becomes the main color just because of the quantity on the model, the horse, the cloak on the actual model itself, the hooves, the, 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 um, the skull and the flames on the horse are all painted this blue color. And because of the quantity of it, it inadvertently becomes the primary or dominant color. And the top cloak painted in this red terracotta color is now the secondary just because there's less of it. But you can see that despite this sort of swap in quantity in terms of the amount of the red and the blue, when you put it alongside other models in the army, it still feels cohesive because the colors are the same, even though the quantity of them has changed. Similarly, when you're looking at models like my Nagash, uh, my Lady Olinder, and the Spirit Torment, the blues do feature a lot more depending on the angle. But what I also do now in these models is I'm blending 
the blue into the terracotta red or vice versa. And this transition, I introduce a bit more of a saturated purple and blue tone to help ease that transition. But again, because they are just slightly more saturated versions of my primary and secondary color, and because the color palette is the same as what's being used throughout the entire army, it doesn't stand out as being different. Even the non-metal metal armor of Nagash is just a more saturated version of the blue recipe. So it's the exact same blue base, only instead of pushing it too strongly into the Iraqi sand, for example, which does desaturate the blue, I used less of that and I used more ivory and white to keep that more saturated blue tone until I get into the highlights. And just as a tangent before carrying on with examples from armies, you can also take this practice and extend it to painting one-offs like display figures, busts, and larger scale pieces that don't necessarily have to belong on the tabletop, but can be for um, competition pieces or just things that you have on the shelf for looking at and for display. This Radagindus I painted ended up actually being the exact same color palette as I used for my Nighthaunt. It's got that sort of aqua blue, that earthy terracotta red, the cappuccino caramel color, and then I introduced some extra colors in terms of the green. I used uh, some browns and some non metamolic colors like the blues and the, the yellows for the silver and gold. A lot more prominently, I play around with some different saturations and uh, more nuancing in terms of colors to add more richness to the piece. But the basic idea of the color palette still holds. By only having a limited number of colors, you create a focus to the piece. And despite having all these things on the model, it doesn't feel as busy as it could be if you had a thousand different colors. And I know that's an exaggeration, but you can extend this sort of thinking into or beyond army painting into painting pieces really where you want to draw that attention and have that focus by limiting your color palette and then keeping your color range within those colors and play around with your values more and your saturations. I think you can create a much more interesting effect than constantly adding different tones of colors to try and grab that uh, attention. So my color concept or mock-up for my Infinity Combined Force is also a really good example of interchangeability in terms of having colors swapped around between primary, secondary, and even tertiary. So very briefly on the color palette, the primary color is this rich saturated green. The secondary becomes this, this off-white, almost sickly pink uh, green color, depending on the nuancing. And then the tertiary color is the blue, which is featured on the base. I do also mix in a bit of um, this sort of red fuchsia color with the foliage. And it becomes a split tertiary color where both of the two are equally balanced and at the same time aren't overpowering my primary and secondary colors. What I mean by that, for example, is when you're looking at this worm model, the first thing you're probably going to see is the green, immediately followed by the off-white, just because they're side by side and they're the most prominent parts of the model, just in terms of quantity of color. Then you're probably going to notice the blue, but equal parts that fuchsia color on the base because uh, they're on or they're in equal quantities on the model and neither one overpowers the other. And then for accents, you have the standard blue grays and brown yellows for the non metal metal silver and gold. Now, while the army itself didn't take off, I don't have um, as huge an interest in Infinity and um, it just became difficult balancing playing so many games and Infinity just wasn't a game I was super interested in. I have used this particular color combination quite often. And you actually see it a lot in my Marvel figures. So this combination of green, fuchsia, an off-white, and then blue. With Mysterio, my She-Hulk, and then even the Hulk. Even though the Hulk doesn't have blue, I'll get on it in a second. Because we're using the exact same limited four colors in combination in different quantities as primary, secondary, tertiary, and even within the, uh, the accent colors, because the colors are so similar, even though we're interchanging the quantity of them, 
um, and where they're being placed and how they're being used. Because this limited color palette is being carried across consistently on these figures, when you have them all together, they still feel like they're part of the same collection. All right, so on Mysterio, for example, we have the green suit, the fuchsia cape, the blue swirls, and then the off-white base. On She-Hulk, we have the green skin. We have uh, pink in the suit with a bit of this off-white color that's also carried on in the base, but um, sort of in different saturations. And then the really dominant blue of the TARDIS. Now, while Hulk himself doesn't have any of the blue, uh, there is a bit of the blue verdigris that pops up in the copper uh, sewer grate on the base. And then we have your standard green, fuchsia, and white or off-white as your primary, secondary, tertiary. And this can be really useful to keep in mind when you're painting uh, models for skirmish games or whether you're looking to differentiate um, specific units apart from each other without trying to break too far away from your color palette. If you want to use those same limited colors by interchanging the quantity of them, how you're using them, and what is your primary, secondary, or tertiary, just in terms of dominance of colors, is a really easy way to take a limited palette and continuously reuse it and repurpose it within the same force. So create that variety and have that distinction between models and units without breaking that cohesion. So very often when we're talking about, or when I'm talking with people about how to develop color palettes and I'm giving input on balancing colors and creating a color schema, people often tend to forget that the base becomes an important part of the model and something you have to consider when balancing your colors. And I'm gonna be using my Necrons for this as an example because the base color of my Necrons actually is my secondary color. I've kept the palette on this army extremely limited and extremely focused using this sort of off-white, um, dirty green khaki color as the primary color. You see it featured on all the armor plates and all of um, like the talons and the large surface areas. And rather than have my secondary color on the model and in keeping with sort of the vision of the army. So first taking a step back, I had originally envisioned a very barren sort of Martian desert or wasteland for the entire force. And the bases were going to be very simple and barren as a result. So I knew that I was going to have some sort of relatively uh, flat or consistently even color tone on the base that would potentially be very, very overpowering. And so when I was developing the color palette for this force, I decided uh, fairly early on that one of the main colors had to be the base. And so using this sort of uh, earthy terracotta red, this became my secondary color, which also features as the chip weathering in the army. So it's a way of bringing that color into the model itself without introducing a new color. It balances well with the red. It pops off a lot. There's a nice contrast between the two. My tertiary color becomes the blue, which is used primarily for orbs, gems, and weapons. And while I take this to off-white, I don't use any of the same whites I use in the armor. So in the armor, it's mostly scale colors, star brown, Mojave white, white sands, and then a bit of ivory for some of the edge highlighting. So they're very yellow-toned, off-white colors. For the blue, it's Nilhak Oxide and AK White or Vallejo White, depending on um, when I was painting it. I swapped color ranges uh, within the past six months. But essentially, it's a pure white. This allows me to take the highlights to a, a very same or similar value, but the saturations are different enough that it makes the blades feel cleaner and almost otherworldly or, or alien-like because they don't feel like they're being highlighted by the same source as everything else in the army. Um, I've used very warm tones as I always do for all of my highlighting, and I deliberately made the choice to keep the highlight tones on my blue very neutral. And this was a way to sort of make the blue part of the models feel separate and alien compared to everything else in the palette. Now, while my black features very heavily on the model, I've actually used it as a way to create space and separate the elements. Because it is a neutral color, and um, it does lean a little bit on the warm side again because of the highlight colors I've used. It's not overly worked 
and therefore it's not fighting for attention and creating any sort of imbalance. Although you could argue that it is a basically fourth supportive color on the palette, so making it a uh, quaternary color. I consider it as more of a, um, a neutral framing color that doesn't fit into the primary, secondary, tertiary color. And it doesn't really pop out because it is black and you don't see it as something that's fighting for your attention. I see it more as, and if you've ever looked at art, negative space. I'm using the black as a way of essentially blanking out areas of the model to, to create that separation between elements of white armor and the base or some of the blue weapons or maybe even the uh, silver and gold metallic elements. And speaking of for Necrons, you would think that silvers would be a pretty dominant color. And it might be depending on the quantity that you're painting. For a lot of my more elite infantry and models and vehicles, I use very little silver and gold. And so those become my accent colors. But if you look at some of my more basic infantry, things like my Immortals, um, my Lich Guard, and my Warriors, silver does feature more prominently. And it does potentially get pushed up from an accent color into maybe a tertiary color or a balancing secondary color, or maybe even pushing it into primary and why uh, the white armor becomes uh, a split tertiary with the blue just because of the quantity of it. But this really keys into the idea of reusing that limited palette in different quantities. And so these colors can interchange between um, being the, the dominant color that draws all your attention or being a supportive color. The idea is that you're able to reuse these colors in your palette to create a, a cohesion within your force regardless of how you're using those colors. As long as you stick to that limited palette, your army will still look very cohesive and balanced as a whole. Something I do want to talk about as well is the idea of introducing a, uh, a unique color. And a good example for this is my Silent King. So the majority of my army um, is this off-white, earth-red, um, blue and black color combination with some silvers and golds scattered in and I wanted to do something incredibly different and uh, unique within the army to have a color to differentiate one specific model nowhere else uh, to really mark out the fact that this model is one of a kind. So when I was painting my Silent King I needed a color for doing the Menhirs, the Cloak and the Blackstone and it didn't feel right doing anything in blue or black. It would have just been a weird imbalance and it wouldn't have drawn the attention I wanted. I leaned back into the historical usage of purple as the color of royalty and I just ended up tweaking it more towards a, a fuchsia tone and if you haven't realized already I'm in a bit of a fuchsia mood lately. And honestly I made this tweak uh, by eye. I basically brought a photo of my Necrons into Photoshop and then laid out a bunch of color swatches and just used a saturation layer to tweak the color until I found a hue that I was comfortable with and that I found tied in aesthetically to the existing palette. So I, I would argue in the specific context of my Silent King as an individual solo model, this future color becomes a split tertiary alongside the blue. And it was my way of, in the context of my army, marking out the Silent King as a unique model. And I'm intentionally not going to use this color anywhere else in the army as a way of signifying the king's importance. So with all that being said, you don't always need to have one cohesive color scheme or palette that ties all your models together. Oftentimes you're leaning more on having a cohesive theme. So for example, the conversions and scratch builds in my Junk Force Overlords, that'll help tie an army together rather than just uh, using and leaning on the colors. So in the case of this particular army, because of the amount of conversions and scratch builds within the force, I ended up using different colors across all of the different units as a way of differentiating them on the table and helping to tell them apart for ease of gameplay. So I wasn't able to maintain a very simple limited color palette across the entire army, but there are some tricks that I ended up using that you can also use um, that will help to suggest that these models all belong together as part of the same collection. So first and foremost, basing is really, really important. And I've deliberately kept this army, uh, the basing, as simple as possible 
to have a bright eye-catching color that carries across all the models. In a sense, this color sort of acts as a um, quote-unquote primary or secondary color because it is so, so bold and so dominant. I also use the same colors for the accents. So things like the metallics, I use the same colors for the silvers and the golds. My graffiti tends to be the same ivory off-white color. And I use the same colors in terms of the yellows and umbers for my rust and weathering. I also introduce the same colors when I'm creating my highlight and shadow mixes. So for example, I use Tenere Yellow and Ivory a lot when I'm mixing my highlights, and I use a lot of Hex Lichen when I'm creating my shadows. I also have a consistent use of weathering powders and oil pin washes to create very similar nuanced colors across the entire army. But then within each unit, you can see that I still adhere to the idea of having a strong primary and secondary color. I do avoid having a, a strong tertiary color um, because my army is already going to be very colorful. Each unit and vehicle will have its own unique primary. And I felt that having a tertiary within each unit would end up being too much, really, really hard to balance. Um, what I did end up doing within each unit was splitting the primary and creating a balancing color that was essentially a very bright, very desaturated version of the primary. So for example, in this uh, green unit, my main color is this green tone, and I balance it by creating an almost tertiary color, but it's the same green. I just brighten it up a lot and then desaturate it to almost, um, there's, I wouldn't say it's no color, but it's not very, very uh, strong and vibrant. But because the color range is still the same as the primary, it doesn't really deviate too far to become its own unique color, but it still allows you to create a separation of details and have two distinct parts that look different, but then feel the same. And then I consider the basing as the secondary color, the sort of desert yellow. And so I have to balance out all my colors around these two, the main color of the model, the primary, and then the secondary of the base. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed, I hope you found it informative and you're able to take at least some of the things I've talked about and apply it to developing your own color schemes and palettes. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like and subscribe for more awesome content in the future. And if you want to check out my other social media platforms, I'll make sure to drop links in the description below. Until next time, happy hobbying.